Today we're talking about South Korea and Japan, two countries who've just changed their relationship status to it's complicated. What do you know, North Korea, China, and Russia have already liked that status update. Now before you say, well, I didn't hear America on that list of two countries, skip. These are our two friends in Southeast Asia, and if our friends are fighting, well, that lessens our leverage on North Korea, China, and Russia. So what's splitting up our lunch table today? Well, it all starts with World War II? Well, at least it's finally not something America did. If you remember back during that time, Japan burned every single bridge they had in Asia, short of the one over the River Kwai. Still though, that's no reason for hostilities today, right? Well, the Korea-Japan conflict we're talking about today started on October 30th, 2018, when the South Korean Supreme Court ruled that one of Japan's largest steel companies needed to compensate four Korean workers who they forced into slave labor. Not a moment too soon with that ruling. Now, as you can imagine, Japan was not pleased about this. Japan, which has long maintained that all such claims have been settled by a treaty struck in 1965, demanded that the South Korean government rein in the courts. Now, South Korea responded, we have an independent judiciary. If you want a state-controlled Supreme Court, I think you might have wanted to check in with our northern neighbors. We have similar names. People get confused. Now, this might all sound like small beans. And it was at the time. But nobody stepped in, so things just continued to roll. On January 2nd, things got real, when South Korea tried to seize the assets of Japanese companies that were refusing to make these new payments. This led Japan to think to itself, what can we do about this? Well, it just so happens that South Korea makes a lot of phones and electronics. And what do you know, we make the materials to make those phones and electronics. As the spat over history escalated, Japan retaliated with an unprecedented move on trade, announcing it would be restricting exports of highly specialized equipment needed to make semiconductors and computer displays. The measure designed to hurt South Korea's high-tech industry. On July 4th, Japan announced a slowdown of tech-based raw materials to South Korea. Now, people are comparing this trade war to ours, despite the fact that it's kind of the opposite. In America, we're saying we're going to buy less of your materials unless you buy more of ours. In this case, Japan is saying we're going to sell you less of our quality materials unless you drop this World War II litigation. Now this is the moment when a lot of Westerners started to look and say, say, this could really be a real problem. In response to this, on August 22nd, South Korea pulled out of a bilateral intelligence deal established between South Korea and Japan, after a lot of pressure from ex-President Obama in 2016. Now this deal enabled the sharing of intelligence to just keep an eye on North Korea, China, and Russia. Of course, soon after that, South Korea doubled down, and rather than wait for Japan's tit, they double tatted. On August 25th, South Korea launched military exercises on a disputed chain of islands. So now we're in this general time period, depending on when I finish writing, filming, and editing this thing, and people are saying, Boy, that escalated quickly. So what's going to happen? Are we going to have a war over the handling of a previous war? Well, thankfully for us, the most powerful force in the world is pushing for peace right now. Cold, hard cash. The two countries have become deeply intertwined over the decades, with a trade relationship now worth about $85 billion a year. That kind of money will mediate quite a few relationships. Everybody has to do business with groups they don't like. If I didn't, I'd never have a bank account. Japan has a special trump card in this relationship though. As I mentioned earlier, Japan in particular holds considerable power as a main supplier of essential raw materials and components to South Korea's high-tech economic machine. These rare materials are, well, rare, and Japan controls 90% of the supply of one of the key materials to making semiconductors and chips. Now, it's really hard to figure out what's going to happen next, 
as recently the United States Secretary of Defense Mark Esper seems to have taken notice of this escalating problem. And while the administration truly couldn't care less about this trade war or Japan's reparations, the second you start saying no to defense agreements, whoo wee, we're googling couples counselors in your area. It's at this point that we need to start talking about the three main players in this conflict to figure out exactly what's going to happen. You have America whose position can be summed up pretty simply. Mark Esper recently said at a Pentagon briefing, we have common threats facing us, North Korea and China and bigger threats, and we're stronger when we all work together. Yeah, again, we really just care about South Korea pulling out of this agreement, and we're going to try to get these two countries to hold hands and sing kumbaya together until we can get that agreement back. It's the other two leaders who are more interesting in this conflict though. Starting with South Korea. In 2015, Japan met long-standing Korean demands for an official apology for the abuse of so-called comfort women in an agreement with Korea's former president, Park Jun-hee. But President Moon Jae-in revoked that agreement when he came into power in 2016. Wow, just a baller move to say apology no longer accepted. That's right, on the Korean side we have the recently elected Moon Jae-in. As you can tell by that apology recession from 2017, this leader really does have an axe to grind about the treatment of Koreans in World War II. One of Moon's platforms was cashing in on anti-Japanese sentiment, and with the slowing economy and the failed implementation of his other platforms, some are speculating he's really leaning into not liking Japan to keep his supporters happy. As the New York Times reported, with his presidency struggling, Mr. Moon is moving to rally his supporters by tapping into hostility towards Japan, refusing to back down in the trade fight and deploying the country's military to assert its territorial claims. Yeah, apparently being vocally anti-Japanese is the equivalent to a US president getting a puppy. We'll all ignore your policies for a few weeks and just love you for it. At the same time, domestic resentment of Japan in Korea is reaching a fever pitch, with Amid escalating trade tensions between Seoul and Tokyo, South Korean consumers are boycotting a whole spectrum of Japanese products, everything from beer to cars. That's completely separate from the government itself though, so I didn't mention it in the calendar. Point is, President Moon has absolutely no incentive to make right with Japan. At the same time though, it takes two to tango. Japan, what's going on with you? He also stressed the two neighbors signed an agreement in December 2015 to promote cooperation, adding he's disappointed to see Seoul breaking the spirit of the deal. Yeah, Japan is pretty frustrated because first in 1965, they signed a deal with Korea that normalized relationships between the two countries and made payments to Korea. While Japan viewed this agreement as, we're good now, we're going to make these payments and then move on. South Korea viewed this agreement as a settlement between countries, but it didn't settle individual claims who could seek their own settlement outside of the agreement. Hence this controversial Supreme Court decision last year that triggered this whole debacle. At the same time, you have the Japanese settlement in 2015 that, well, if the 1965 settlement didn't cover those people, surely this one would. Now Japan's getting a little annoyed because Korea came back with a domestic Supreme Court decision and started trying to seize money from their companies and reparations. Japan's really leaning on two quotes from the 1965 treaty to lay out why this should not be happening. First, Article 2 of the 1965 treaty, which declared that all financial claims between their countries and their people were settled completely and finally. And second, Japan claims that this ruling goes against the treaty's Article 3 that specified dispute resolution measures. Now before we go on, you know I'm never going to look at a good Supreme Court case and pass it up. Korea's claim is that none of this applies because this is a not anti-Japan lawsuit, but rather a lawsuit against Japanese companies that enslaved people. Japan doesn't seem to agree with that interpretation of the treaty though. 
This decision would open up literally hundreds of Japanese companies to lawsuits over their actions in World War II. So that's exactly what's going on between South Korea, Japan, and the United States right now. In an odd twist, this fight is over Mitsubishi having to pay about $50,000 to 5 women and $480,000 to 6 male workers. Clearly this conflict is over more than the almost million dollars in reparations that triggered it. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support independent journalism looking into international and domestic issues, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, Thank you for watching.